And thank you for joining us for our last and final segment. We have with us uh, from the Museum of Belize and the Belize Audubon Society, we have Dr. Stephen Zitter, Zitzer, Zitzer um, who's a taxidermist. And we also have Alexis Salazar, who's the director of the Museum of Belize. And we have Derisi Chuck. Did I get that right? Darice. Oh, wow, Darice, I was close. She's the <laughs> Environmental okay. Education and Communication Director. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to our black and white owl as well. <laughs> that's right in the middle of the table. It's amazing how realistic these look. They're, well, I mean, they are real, but they're not alive. Correct. And I think it's a great way for us to understand uh, kind of the work that has gone into this particular exhibit. I want to step back and, and find out how uh, you three came together. So we have environment, we have the museum, and we have you and your passion and, and your work that you do. How did this all come together? It's a long, <laughs> a long I story. I bet it is, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, it uh, started out when, when I first started at, at the museum. Um, one of the first um, houses of culture that I visited was, was the San Ignacio House. And Dr. Zitzer had, had his display there. So from that point, almost two years ago, we were talking about, well, bringing, bringing it into the Museum of Belize. And then um, I think last November, we, we spoke again. And um, we, we sought out, I, I think, Audubon uh, approached us with, with um, this idea to do an exhibit. And I said, well, we know somebody who, who does birds. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, that's how we, we teamed up to, to, to put the exhibit at the Museum of Belize. Yeah. I guess this fits right into your birding culture yeah, at definitely. last. Definitely. Um, of course, our priority still remains getting people outdoors to do actual <laughs> bird watching. Um, but definitely, we saw this as a, a fantastic collaboration with the museum and Dr. Zitzer, who we, we knew before, um, because we do have some of these birds at one of our nature centers at St. Herman's Blue Hole National Park. Mm. And so we, we continue to use them as um, educational tools. Um, not everybody is into the bird watching. And so um, using these birds, the unfortunate situation that caused them to, to die, um, and Dr. Zitzer can tell you all about that, yeah. then we get to display them and people can learn more about these birds. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm curious as to how this became your passion. <laughs> <laughs> well, my story starts uh, back in 1962. I'm 66 years old. Whoa. And oh. I grew up in the US, in Wisconsin. <coughs> Excuse me, and I started bird watching when I was 12 just because I saw a little bird called a black and white warbler, which is a migratory species, it spends its winters in Belize, and it nests in Wisconsin. Now I have my backyard. <laughs> I've been in Belize seven years now. So, being a bird watcher, uh, I knew I liked to go to museums as a young child growing up in Wisconsin, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, one of my favorites. And I knew you could do taxidermy. So. And birds get hit by cars, they get injured and die naturally. Yeah. And uh, so I found a few, put it in my freezer at home, and I had them there for a few years. My mother threatened to <laughs> throw them away if I didn't do something. Hey, that, that, that's a bit morbid, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, was a, it's, it wasn't the freezer that we made. <laughs> so uh, that's when I started yeah. doing the bird work then. Uh, actually, then I went to college, and my PhD is in plant physiology. So. I went in different directions with my career in academia than yeah. the bird thing, but this has always been a good thing. You to took do. the birds out the fridge though before you right, left. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it took me about ten birds. It just so happened this flock of winter finches flew across the road, and a whole bunch of them got killed. And flew. I whipped open the trunk on my '61 Volvo and threw about fifty of them in there, and <laughs> that's what taught me how to do the taxidermy. <laughs> This is before so where YouTube. most of us were getting <laughs> sad about seeing a dead bird, you were excited because you had well, you saw the yeah. potential. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. So uh, then, uh, so I spent the last 25 years as a plant ecologist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I came from Las Vegas, Nevada to Belize. Mm -hmm. Been here seven years now. I have permanent residency. And uh, in 2014, uh, the Audubon Society has Christmas counts where we go out and count as many birds as we can mm -hmm. around the Christmas time. So I did the count in Punta Gorda where Lee Jones, who wrote the Birds of Belize book, and yeah. I also met Sarah Mann, who's been on your program. She has the Belize Raptor Center. Yeah. <coughs> and so we're talking and, you know, she works with birds and she was wor actually working with um, Nikki Bruxton at Belize Bird Rex Rescue, the yeah. 
premier bird hospital in Belize. So yeah. I said, well, what happens with the birds when you die? Oh, we just burn them. So I said, well, <laughs> I could start doing that for you then. You know, they're all protected species. Uh, you cannot hunt any of these. Uh, there's a few species you can hunt, teal, uh, some ducks, but everything else is protected. So I went to the forestry department to get a permit to do the work, to preserve them for educational purposes. I can't sell these on the street corner. So, yeah. so after I got that permit, um, I started doing work for Sarah Mann. She would take the birds to schools to show um, kids. They don't travel that well, so they got kind of beat up. Wow. And my wife, uh, Miss Delena Lesso, who was my business manager, promoter, mm. um, we liked to go to the House of Culture in San Ignacio to see all the events that were going on there. And, you know, different exhibits come and go. And so my wife approached uh, the House of Culture. Would you like a temporary exhibit of birds? And so they said, sure. So we had that for a year there. This was a temporary House of Culture. Then it moved to the new House of Culture where they renovated the hospital and, you know, they have a lot of space there, so the birds were there. So it all started with a bird that whispered to you about this place called Belize. Yeah, right? well, I, I, I came to Belize in 1991, and I, I've, I've never forgotten it. So, but how, I mean, this, uh, what does it take to yeah. put a bird back together? Is, yeah. is that the best way to say it? Uh, well, to stuff it, really. Yeah, to stuff it. Well, pr first of all, it has to be in good enough condition for me to work on it. Okay. Meaning, once it dies, it can be bloody and torn up, but if it's fresh, I can do anything with it. The bigger the bird, the longer it, gets, it can stay before it starts to decompose. So it lays on the side of the road for 15 minutes, maybe the ants will get it right away. If it's there for three hours in the sun, it starts to decompose. Then I'm kind of out of luck. I will save the parts, the legs and things like that, but then I can't do anything with it. So once it's picked up, it goes in the freezer right away. You can keep it in the freezer forever as long as you keep it in a plastic bag, otherwise it will dry out, freezer burn, everybody knows about that. So, so once I, I'm, I come to the point where I have time to skin a bird, it takes me a day to do to a bird it. like this. So I take it out of the freezer, I thought, it's a bird like a chicken, and you part the feathers here, make one cut, turn the whole thing inside out, up to the skull, because the beak is attached to it, I sprinkle a powder on it, turn it back inside out again, and then the body I make out of newspaper, and then there's a wire that runs through the head and all the way through the ass. Um, and then I grab <laughs> the wire and I run two leg wires, one through each leg, and it goes through the body. So it's like a little Gumby figure with wires. And then I go out and find beautiful pieces of wood and I study the birds, how they look when they're alive. And so you can stage it. You can change the position right, of right, the bird. Right. Um, I, can, I can do whatever I want as long as it's all there. A lot of birds are injured, some missing feathers. Now this one, if you look closely, it's missing a couple tail feathers, but when I pose it, we wouldn't I, know. I, I hide the bad stuff. <laughs> or if it's schmucked up on the back, I'll put it on the wall so you don't see that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it takes me two to three hours to skin it, two hours to stuff it, and depending on the complexity of the pose, another two to three hours. So, and the small bird, I like to do the small ones I can do in two or three hours. Like I said, this one took me a day. So then after it dries, some of these birds, uh, the feet and the bill, are flashy and alive and they're brightly colored like a toucan and when they dry those yes. colors fade so actually I have painted those. You need to so. color those on. And the eyeballs because that's something that, that we... Uh, the, the two major specialty items, the eyes and the preservative powder I get from a taxidermy supply company in the U.S. Taxidermy is actually a very big business for hunters in the U.S. Uh, mammals which I don't touch because it's yeah. a different technique but birds, ducks, geese and all that kind of stuff is very popular. I, I was a professor at Texas A&M, which is a very pro-hunting state with wintering wildfowl. So I did lots of geese and ducks <laughs> and supplemented my income. So, <laughs> so how, how much of the real bird, the feathers, the beak? Everything's is there the, from the skin the outside. Skin, so the skin is the same? Yeah. Because um, that's what, what I said. When it starts to decompose, the skin, even though it's very thin, is made up of three different layers and they start to separate and the feathers attached to the outer layers start to separate. So the feathers start falling out, so I'm Oh, that's why that. you need it. Uh -huh. So I, I'm not gonna go back and try to glue every feather back in it, but. <laughs> <laughs> and I have too many other birds to work with. Unfortunately, yeah, there's, I never run out of material because things are always getting hit. They get sent to the zoo, Belize Bird Rescue, Audubon, um, and then they call me and it died. And mm -hmm. I, I come so w what birds did you decide to put together for the exhibit? Um, at the time, in the, the, the um, exhibit in San Ignacio, I had about 60 birds. 
and they picked out 30 for the exhibit here, and I think they have about 10 at St. Herman's. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, seems a bit, it seems a bit random, though. You have to wait until a bird drops down dead or is hit by a car. Um, and, and I wanted to, I want probably you guys to address it in the museum and Audubon. Even when we take our family members to the zoo, it's a different experience. Because me looking at this owl mm -hmm. here, I have a different appreciation for this animal Indeed, yes. than when it's alive. And it might sound weird, but I'm up close. I have no fear. I can look at its natural beauty in a controlled way. Um, can you talk about the benefits of this sort of project as it complements what we do at the zoo, the live animal, and how it sparks an interest, a love, and probably a need to protect and love these animals, which we have a lot of. Yes. So we probably wouldn't do taxidermy because in Belize, we and say, I'm not taxidermy, not because I have a million in my backyard. <laughs> America, you see them once a year. We yeah. see them every day. Well, in Belize, to touch on the, the amount of bird species that we have in Belize, is close to 600. And as you said, we don't often get the opportunity to see a bird up close like this. Yes, it is not alive, but it still allows you to view that bird in its entirety and, and appreciate it. If you visit the Museum of Belize, where the exhibit is placed, you'll be able to read more about these birds and the stories that come along with these birds, how they came to be preserved, um, some of the natural history, where they live, what they feed on, and some of the myths associated with these yeah. birds, especially the owls. Owls, I was going to tell you, that's when yes. I saw owls, I was like, uh-oh. Some of the myths, and um, Dr. Zitzer can tell you, the collection that he has, has a lot of raptors, the larger birds, yeah. the birds of prey, because they're, more, they're bigger, they're easily targeted by people who want to harm them, um, getting hit by cars. Just the nature of these animals mm -hmm. make them more susceptible to being harmed. And so the collection, you'll see a lot of um, birds of prey in the collection that we have at the museum. Um, Dr. Zitzer doesn't have 600 birds in his collection. <laughs> and so from what, from what he has, we just chose a sample of what would represent birds of prey, what would represent forest birds, what would represent water birds okay. that we find just in the cross section. Just a cross section of the, and that's how we came up with the 60 birds um, in the exhibit. What's the most common cause of death for the birds? A hit by a vehicle mm. and second probably shot, shot. Mm -hmm. mm. and third, window kills. They're almost like humans. Big glass windows in their houses, it's little small fine. ones, yes. Yes, and some of the can smaller birds die from migration, exhaustion oh, yeah. as well. Um, can, I ask, can I ask this selfishly then? Um, are there any toucans and any macaws? Because those are animals that, those are birds, which yes. Yes. are so beautiful. I've seen them from afar, and I am mesmerized. There are two. There is in a the exhibit? toucan in the exhibit, a Kill Bill toucan, wow. the national bird. And there is a, a colored arasari, which is family to the toucan as well. So those two are in mm -hmm. the exhibit. So again, it it's creates that excitement, especially for school children when they visit that exhibit. I'm excited to see. See, he's talking child. about the colorful <laughs> one. I want to know, do you have any harpy eagles? I always think that's one of the most no, magnificent. Uh, no. It's Great. a very rare species now. Yeah. They have them at the zoo, so yeah. when the no, one at the zoo dies, I'm sure I'll get it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, no, but other What's What's some of the birds that, I mean, like, which ones stand out to you that you were excited to be able to uh, stuff and prepare for a display? Well, um, going back to my original, as, as a bird watcher, as a child, I saw everything with my naked eyes. And, then I saved up my bus fare and I bought my first pair of binoculars. No, my first bird book, my mm -hmm. Peterson Field Guide. Mm -hmm. Then I saved up for binoculars. So now you go from your naked eyes to seeing with binoculars. And then when you get a dead bird and start working, it's, it's a whole another level. So each bird is different. All owls have ear openings that can be big or little. Some hunt more by their eyes. So just taking it apart and seeing it. Um, yeah, it's it's a whole different model. But do you like the the they're uh, all good. They're all good or the little uh, ones or the colorful ones? Like an owl, you uh, you can do more with their neck. You know, they. Uh, I can do anything with any bird. Yeah. So I, I, in fact, posing is the fun part. So the little ones, I get quicker to the posing part. So I actually like those a little bit easier. Uh. But for the exhibit, for the education pur um, purpose of these birds, the parrots. Um, right. are oh. there as well mm -hmm. because of the story about parrots and their being um, poached for mm -hmm. the pet trade um, here in Belize and that's something we want to discourage so again the parrots tell a story yeah. um, 
the birds of prey. And there's one large game species there, the coracel, mm. in I the exhibit that, as well. Yeah. It's a beautiful specimen. Yeah. But again, they have all the details telling that it. story about the threats to this bird, yeah. its loss of habitat because of the clearing of forest and because of hunting pressures. So those are the stories we hope that when people visit the exhibit, they will be able to read the information and take away those stories to share with others. Alexis, what's been the traction for this exhibit um, versus some of, I mean, you've always had butterflies. So there have been some, some animals in, in the museum before, but what has the feedback been for this particular exhibit? Well, it, it meshes well with the, the insects. So it's yeah. kind of like a natural history yeah. wing now that we have at the museum. Um, we've been getting more uh, primary school students. Of mm. course, they're attracted to, to the colorful birds. Um, it just, uh, we approach it a bit differently. We saw it more not just the opening of an exhibit, but as a project. So we've been doing educational outreach into schools about birds and so on. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interest from tourists who come in, uh, from birders who, who um, are in Belize for a little while and can't go out and see mm -hmm. all yeah. the birds that they, they, they come in. Um, so I think it's one of the, the better exhibits that we've, we've launched at the museum. If Which I one really wows people, just, just the kids that um, come in? The, the curacao. The curacao. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I, I'm a tactile learner, so I like to touch mm -hmm. things. And it's very ironic that I work at a museum. Because <laughs> you can't yeah. anything. So uh, we've been back and forth with Dr. Zitzer about getting a, a bird that is, can be used to, to right. as a, as a Something people, something can touch. people Everybody can wants to touch. touch. Everybody, Everybody wants to touch. touch. Everybody yes. wants to I touch. do too. I'm here. <laughs> like and resisting. They, it can handle some touching, but yeah, eventually it, they'll fall yeah. apart. Well, now with mass traffic coming through it and a museum, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like at the House of Culture in San Ignacio, no, some of the the kids, <laughs> some of the birds that got smashed, I saved their claws so they can touch yeah. their claws. So, you can touch an owl claw versus a osprey claw. So there's lots of different things they can play with. <laughs> if, if I understand this. Um, properly, it's your collection that is a temporary loan, a temporary exhibit it's to the, the museum. It actually, the birds belong to the government. Oh, they belong to the government. I take it. I was paid through Audubon and the museum to do the tax. That's good news. But I pay the forestry department two hundred dollars a year for my permit too. So I'm paying to do it. Oh, nice. They're paying me to display them, yeah. and the display at the House of Culture. I in San Ignacio today there was groups of kids going through and they let me know and I would have been there today too to, that's, that's awesome to teach news. the kids. So do, do you see room um, both from the Ottoman side and from the museum side of having a complete department or section of as close to the 600 <laughs> as possible <laughs> so that people like me um, can go and see uh, these birds there definitely is room for that. At our protected areas that we co-manage, we yeah. have nature centers. We have four nature centers. And so as we begin to evolve and expand our nature centers, they're like mini museums. Mm -hmm. So there is room to add more of those to, to the collection that we have already in one of the nature centers. So I would say yes. But for now, the turtle birds at the museum yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is good. It's a good place. <laughs> and some, some birds are so rare that you would not want to go out yes. and collect them either. Yes. So. But they die anyway. So yeah, but the, usually they die in, in the forest and don't. No and if you would it. find it, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, the, yeah, this of all the black and white owls in the country, this is a, a tiny fraction of the population. How expensive is it to do? Uh, all the materials are maybe thirty dollars worth of materials in there. But the value time? of it is about how much? The bird itself. Uh, uh, having it in. Well, this if this was a game bird in the so U.S. Sure. and I was trying to uh, doing it for a customer, I would probably charge something like. Three hundred dollars U.S. to do that, mm. at so least. So it's not difficult. Hunter's got a lot of money in the U.S., so <laughs> <laughs> it would be difficult for us to get these together um, on a larger scale. In a bigger display at the museum? Uh, for more birds. Oh, oh. My, my my goal is beyond the thirty. I'm greedy. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I, th I think at this point we we have across the country close to seventy-five species by now. So <laughs> it's ever growing. Nice. I have two jabaroos in my freezer right now. What? Oh, wow. So, yeah, uh, always. I'm not going into your freezer. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the question. Um, the museum has done feasibility studies to say what? Well, we've come up with four exhibits that we'd like to see in a national museum. 
Yeah. Uh, one of them calls for a natural history exhibit, so yeah. of course I'm um, having birds. Um, and Jabu. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a future would be, would be a part for of that. So there's a future exhibit for, in the museum. For, for yes. in, in How museum. long do they last? Indefinitely. Uh, like I said, it's what newspaper wire and a preservative powder that is, it's not toxic to humans, but it's antimicrobial. So nothing really attacks it except people don't want to touch them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, ironically in the U.S., uh, I did some stuff for people, game birds, and their pet cats would like to go get them. Ooh. <laughs> but like okay. I said, if they're torn up, I can actually sew it all back together. So yeah. there's really nothing there to decompose. It's feathers are like your fingernail chitin. It's very durable. Um, I take all the what flesh out of there. There's nothing left inside to rot. What, do what you are you... Sorry, I just wanted to... The, the process fascinates me. What have you learned the most about... I mean, when you turn a bird inside out, you understand so much more of their intricacies. What's fascinated you the most? Uh, mostly how the eyes and, and ears are arranged. Um, after that, every bird's a little bit different in terms of how soft the skins are. Some are really delicate, and I have to use my tweezers. Others, you can get your fingers in there and pull and, and tug. Other birds, like doves and pigeons, I don't know if that's the way they evolve, but their feathers are really loosely attached, so it can be as fresh as you can be, but they fall out easily, so. Um, mm. every, every bird's a new challenge, certainly. None, even the same species is different, so the last one of these I did had flown into a barbed wire fence, and its wing was all mangled, so. Um, I'm always <laughs> excited about doing new species, but everything's always different, but in general, the less damaged it is, the okay. easier it is, yeah. and I have more flexibility. What, what, what do you, what would you like to see come from an exhibit like this? Would you like to see more taxidermists? Would you like to see people have an appreciation for the live ones? What would you like to get out of it? Definitely standpoint? the appreciation for the live ones as I teach the kids uh, when they come to the House of Culture is that they're all protected species for a reason. They provide significant ecosystem services. Uh, pest control, insects, small rodents, uh, pollinators, hummingbirds, uh, seed dispersal, so birds provide a huge range of ecosystem services that we'd be without. So that's what I want to emphasize with this. Now, birding is a very big thing in Belize. Ecotourism, birding yes, is a very popular a thing. Growing. So it promotes that and if children, now I want to be a bird guide or something like that or learn yeah. the skill. Um, there's it besides, may spark the interest. Yeah. Right, there, there's career Definitely. possibilities. And I'd imagine that's part of what Audubon is hoping to do. As well, exactly. <laughs> We're hoping to inspire the next generation of conservation leaders in this country, you know. And, and bird watching has been that step for, that first step for mm -hmm. many conservationists in this country. And so we hope that the children who visit will be better able to appreciate, to learn about these birds, and then participate in our bird citizen science activities that we run throughout the year. Yeah. And how long is the exhibit going to be? Um, it's temporary, so six months. Six months. Um, at around that time, we hope uh, we hope to open a new, new exhibit um, for International Museum Day. So, mm -hmm. after that, the birds go to the other one, and then they they have their own idea of what they will do. Yes, yeah. continue to use them for educational purposes. But in the meantime, we can see them all together in one space at the Museum right. of mm -hmm. Belize. Yes. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and sharing uh, all the details of the work that you do and, of course, uh, the mission behind this exhibit itself. And please do visit the exhibit at the museum. Looks interesting. See. I could just <laughs> imagine how the kids are fascinated. I mean, we're fascinated as adults. Imagine, imagine the kids mm -hmm. when they see them. They look so real. Yes, everyone can appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. It's free on Saturdays and it's air conditioned. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to go ahead and take our final break. And when we come back, we'll have a wrap up. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm.